I know uh, a lot of people talk about how you never find bones in the woods of the Bigfoot. And it's certainly true, probably. <coughs> we have found bones. Lots of people find bones. They probably just look at them askance, thinking it's a bear or some other animal. Um, but there are always bones in the woods. Um, and I just came across another one here. This is a... Uh, turn the camera down and I'll show you. This is a uh, deer kill site. And I found some hair. It's all white deer hair. And over here is the bones. That's the, uh, the, front, the front foot, I believe. Here's the horse. That's a deer kill. That's a pretty small one. Um, I'm guessing it's quite likely uh, maybe a yearling. Probably not much older than that, but you know, it's just uh, just goes to show you that uh, you do indeed uh, find uh, bones in the woods. Hey everybody, I want to uh, welcome you to a uh, another episode of uh, Bigfoot Tales coming to you from the great state of Maine, none greater. And I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a subject that uh, has been cropping up recently. Many of the forums on uh, Facebook and uh, various other uh, forums that uh, I peek in on from time to time. And that's the subject of why there are no bones. Um, well, there's a lot of answers for that. Obviously, if they're real creatures, they must die, and if they must die, then uh, there has to be remains somewhere. But uh, let's look at this uh, uh, deer kill that I found a couple of days ago, and I've come back to it here and turn the camera around for just a moment. As you can see, those are deer hair. Frequently, coyotes will gang up on a deer and kill it, uh, tear it to pieces, and haul the pieces off. Occasionally, very occasionally, you can find some remains. Not that often. I usually find deer remains on the, on the uh, uh, frequency of maybe one to two per year. Uh, but the subject keeps coming up of why are there no Bigfoot bones. Uh, well, there's two answers to that. Number one, obviously, there is no Bigfoot. Um, it's just a figment of our imagination. And they don't exist, and that's why there are no Bigfoot bones. Um, number two, it's a purely supernatural type of uh, affliction that we've been blessed with, um, and it's demonic in nature, and thus has no physical presence and hence, there would be no bones. A yeah, third alternative, um, as we look at this here, this is what, right there, various uh, bones and remnants of cartilage and stuff. But the third issue with the bones of Bigfoot, and why we don't have any, it's quite likely we do have them, but we don't know what they are. And this, uh, this is actually a deer kill. Again, like I said, there's a path it goes right through here. I could not find any other remains. Um, I searched that way for quite a ways, and. It goes right up around that way, and I could find no more remains of it. But this uh, this area is actually on the edge of the uh, wood where I have found uh, Bigfoot sign before. Okay, now I want to go over a, a couple of three articles that I have that I've dug up uh, regarding bones and giant bones, and a lot of the discussions 
that seem to uh, flow through. Boy, humid and muggy today. Very buggy. Uh, but some of the uh, conversations that flow through many of the uh, forums that uh, I've delved into uh, deal with the issue of giants and uh, some sort of conspiracy that uh, giant bones are, are being hidden. Um, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about that and I want to tie in to an article that I found from uh, 1944 regarding a uh, Gigantopithecus black eye. Um, that uh, it was actually a designation that was given by a uh, uh, researcher by the name of Von Koningswald. Um, he uh, actually, the story is that he found teeth in various uh, apothecary shops in China. Uh, the reality is, of course, uh, it wasn't really him. It uh, was actually uh, his assistants that actually found them and then later on he went to Hong Kong um, and dug through some of them uh, where the mystery actually uh, comes to light is uh, with the find of a giant jawbone um, but we'll get into that in just a minute uh, and we also have an article I found regarding uh, an official at the Smithsonian Institution uh, poo-pooing and uh, dismissing the idea that uh, giants or tall humans of the uh, you know seven to nine foot range ever existed. Um, but we'll get into that in a minute. This first uh, this first article is actually from the, uh, the Pittsburgh Pat Press. Um, it was in uh, Tuesday, September thirteenth of uh, nineteen thirty-two, when this one came out. But uh, essentially. Uh, Washington County graves yield remains of a race of 10,000 years ago. 49 skeletons found. Archaeologists amazed at excellent condition of teeth. Um, and when I get back to the studio, I'm going to read through that. Uh, but essentially, before I go through all of that, um, the article talks about a bunch of skeletons um, that were found. Uh, 49 bodies in Washington County. Pennsylvania, where they say one skeleton is of a giant nearly eight feet tall. Um, they liken this under the mound builders of Ohio, which is an interesting thing. Um, you'll see when I uh, overlay a lot of these things that um, what happens or will happen is that when I uh, get into putting these pictures up and you'll see where there's a, a source in Ohio where uh, some giants were unearthed. Um, also, this uh, space in Pennsylvania where some giants were unearthed. Um, if you draw a straight line between those two communities, just about halfway in between them is uh, Ohio's Salt Lake, Salt uh, Pork State Park, uh, which as most of us know is a, a heavy area for Bigfoot sightings and uh, uh, stories coming from. Uh, so that area may well be uh, a huge uh, encumbrance of uh, population of these creatures that we seek. Um, uh, this device is not working very well. Um, I'm not going to be able to read them very well. So what I'll do is, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to uh, the studio um, either tonight or in the morning and uh, I'll uh, actually transpose those uh, clippings from those articles and uh, we'll have a more in-depth a discussion on uh, exactly what's going on with that. Uh, but uh, for now, um, Bigfoot bones, are there any? I'm sure there are, and we get into a lot of the issues and discussions involving DNA research um, and a lot of the arguments for and against it. Um, I think one of the problems that we have is, number one, uh, all too often the scientists that look at this issue um, tend to regard their search as one for a lower primate DNA search. Part of this comes from the fact that uh, von Konigswald uh, promoted originally the idea that uh, the fossilized teeth and bone, jawbone that he found was from a Gigantopithecus black eye is what he named it. But uh, there's an interesting twist on that. and. Uh, 
We'll get into that in a little bit more depth when I uh, get back into uh, uh, my studio and uh, I'm able to get all things together and uh, put out on the screen for you so that you can see it in a, in a reasonable fashion uh, without me being eaten alive by uh, all these monster mosquitoes. Um, some of them I think are almost uh, pterodactyl-like, but uh, they're huge and they're all over the place. So I'm going to uh, cut this little filming off short and uh, I'm going to head back to my studio where uh, there aren't any bugs. See you in a bit. Okay, everybody. We're back in my uh, studio. Um, it was a uh, pretty buggy out last night. Uh, I think those uh, mosquitoes were actually uh, mini pterodactyls. They were pretty huge, and they were getting all over me, well, even though I was covered with that deet. Um, however, we'll get back to the stories here, and I'm going to uh, we're going to go over four different articles that um, I've tied together to present or um, intend to present a single posit that um, kind of difficult to say. Um, in one hand, um, I want to say we've been lied to, but on the other hand, have we really been lied to? Uh, we get into a lot of issues of uh, conspiracy theorists and, and things like that involving Bigfoot and the lost races of giants and things like that, especially as they uh, tie into uh, many of the uh, hoaxes of the past. But um, two articles that I'm going to start off with are uh, one from the Deseret Evening News from uh, Thursday of January 26th of 1899. And the other one, uh, we're going to jump forward in time a little bit to uh, September 13th of 1932. Uh, and we'll look at an article in the uh, Pittsburgh Press uh, newspaper. Uh, both of these have to deal with not Bigfoot, uh, but giant's bones. Uh, many of the ideas surrounding Bigfoot is that uh, these giant bones were actually uh, deceased Bigfoot. Um, and first off, I want to uh, I want to address the issue here uh, with the Dr. Sykes's recently reduced study um, that indicates that none of the samples uh, provided clear-cut evidence that there exists a uh, uh, a Bigfoot. Um, they were all uh, easily determinable uh, samples as to the origin. Um, there was only a couple that had some human in there. Now. Uh, keep in the back of your mind, um, there is a certain faction of the Bigfoot community, the greater Bigfoot community, that is, that uh, seems to insist that Bigfoot is some sort of a wood ape or uh, unknown ape-like primate, uh, not of human origin, uh, but uh, much of this descends from two different areas and as uh, those of you who've been following me for a long time know that I am primarily a uh, interested in folklore I'm a folklorist um, um, I look at the stories from yesterday and uh, try to piece them together to uh, create a picture of what life was really like in, in the bygone days of our uh, creation um, and one of the things we have to keep in mind as we look at this Bigfoot phenomenon is that uh, prior to right around the turn of the century, uh, the late 1890s or so, 1880s, on up to uh, the early 1900s, um, these things that we're chasing that we call Bigfoot today were formerly known as wild men, wild men of the wood, wood hose, and there's a bunch of different names for them. Uh, but they all translate into uh, wild man of the woods. Um, now about the, the latter 1800s, when the stories of uh, Rudyard Kipling and Edgar Rice Burroughs towards uh, the 1880s, 1890s time frame, came into being where they talked about um, uh, and created uh, anthropomorphic uh, simian populations, uh, it wasn't until then that these wild men of the woods started to be referred to as apes or uh, mountain apes. And uh, there are several different colloquialisms involved with that. But uh, essentially, that was when Bigfoot started to be referred to as an ape. Um, 
And of recent years, uh, during the, uh, the latter 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, um, many people have developed the idea that uh, Bigfoot is a descendant of a extinct ape by the name of uh, Gigantopithecus black eye. And this one of the articles that I'm going to share with you today um, sheds a little bit of light on the actual discovery of the molars and the jawbone of this uh, so-called Gigantopithecus and uh, who put an interesting twist on that that I have yet to uh, find any uh, information on to uh, where the real hidden story behind that is. But we'll get into that in just a few minutes. Anyhow, we'll start back in uh, 1899. Again, this is from the Desert Evening News. It's Thursday, January 26th. And uh, this uh, I'm going to put up a, uh, a slide here of uh, Miamisburg, uh, Ohio, from Google Maps. Uh, it, it shows you the rough uh, location of where this uh, story comes from. Uh, but it's hi highlighted, uh, Giant's Bones Found in Ohio. It's a uh, byline out of uh, Miamisburg, Ohio. Uh, and the story says, If the Miamisburg, Ohio correspondent of the Galveston News is correctly informed, the scientific world has a find that should prove of the in intensest interest to archaeologists all over the country. According to the report, there ha and, uh, by the way, well, as I'm reading this, there's actually a, a couple of lines down through this copy of the print that I'm reading. So, uh, some of the words are a little bit obscured, and I'm trying to jump ahead as I read to uh, to make through them. So, if I sound a little jumbled, that, that's the reason why. According to the report, there has been just unearthed the skeleton of a prehistoric man whose contour and physical peculiarities will do much to strengthen the faith of those persons who cling to the opinion that the world was once peopled with giants. The frame is of heroic proportions, and the head of a size never approached by even the greatest giants within the memory of man. Two men were digging gravel in a pit at a point a short distance away from the town. They were Edward W. Gebhardt and Edward Kaufman. They had been working away for some time when the pick of Gebhardt encountered a resistance and, investigating the cause of the obstruction, the workmen disclosed the skull of a human being. Further digging developed the fact that the location of the gravel pit was the burial place of a man of a size unheard of in this generation. Proceeding carefully, the men unearthed the skeleton of a man about eight feet tall. The face must have been angular, very angular. Its outline in this respect resembles that of a gorilla, the similarity being striking. The jaw bones are intact and show that their possessor was patterned in the most powerful fashion. The teeth are models of strength and beauty of form. The body was not only a relic of interest to those engaged in scientific research found in the past. A small flat stone about three inches long and two inches wide was discovered in the opening. It lay within a few inches of the skull of the prehistoric man. Its local examiners insist the fine should be termed. Through one end of the stone had been drilled a small hole, possibly intended to be used as an opening for the fitting of a handle. It is pointed out by those who have had their theory of the species of the discovery questioned that the stone, so evidently the work of human hands, clearly indicates that the skeleton was that of a man and not that of a mammoth monkey. And that's the end of that article. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out with is towards the end. Uh, we have a pointed stone, roughly pointed stone, that has a hole drilled through it. Um, in the Bigfoot discussion, we have no indication that uh, Bigfoot ever has ever made any tools. Um, therefore, we have a, a bit of a strange uh, anomaly here uh, where we have to consider a couple of different things. Either number one, this was a true giant human being, um, or number two, this was not a giant human being, but a giant something else that's human-like as far as its skeletal structure goes, and that the stone that once had a handle on it 
was a weapon that quite likely, or possibly rather, uh, may have been an instrument used to fell this giant. The description roughly matches what a lot of the uh, uh, descriptions that we have of Bigfoot or Sasquatch uh, would be uh, were we to find a skeleton of a uh, Sasquatch. Again, it's about eight feet tall. Uh, most of the Bigfoot descriptions that we've heard uh, average somewhere in the seven to eight foot tall. Um, there are some extreme cases. Uh, I've heard stories anywhere of 12, 14 foot tall, some even bigger. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, um, I think these are, are way out of proportion. Um, I don't think the people necessarily uh, sharing these stories are lying, uh, but I do believe that their height estimation um, is uh, badly um, swayed by their imagination. Uh, a lot of times the human mind will look through their eye and see a tall person and automatically guesstimate that person to be much taller than they are. Uh, large part because there's nothing really nearby to uh, um, compare that being with. That's why when you go to like a convenience store and you'll see these stripes uh, measuring height on the exit doorway to the store, um, that way any sales clerk that gets robbed can actually look at the uh, criminal is, well, this is a theory anyway, so I don't know how many people are actually going to be looking at the uh, criminal for matching it up to a height. But those stripes and um, ruler-like tapes that are beside the doors of the uh, convenience stores are actually so that any person observing uh, a criminal or robber going through the doorway will be able to more accurately develop uh, an idea of how tall that person was. Uh, but when you're out there in the woods and it's usually dark, uh, either uh, the sun is setting and the shadows are long or the sun is rising and the shadows are equally as long, um, we tend to have a hard time estimating size. Uh, but this actually also uh, kind of corresponds to another story that uh, I, I've shared in the past from uh, the island of Deer Isle, Maine, uh, where uh, back during the early 1800s, a, uh, two skeletons were found underneath a uh, blown over tree. Uh, one of them about eight feet tall, the other one a uh, uh, normal sized man. And through the uh, taller one, uh, the skeleton uh, was man like, even though giant in size, um, actually had a copper dart. Uh, which would have been an arrow head uh, inside its uh, what would have been its chest cavity. Uh, so we have more than one story from the past. And remember, every story that you have, if you want it to be believed, has to have another story to uh, verify uh, that information. And we're going to jump forward in time to the uh, the second article, uh, and this is from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, newspaper, the Pittsburgh Press, on uh, Tuesday, September 13th of 1932. Uh, highlights of the article are prehistoric giant bones are found. Washington County mounds give up a secret of race that vanished 10,000 years ago. 49 skeletons are dug up by archaeologists. Uh, second uh, set of headlines is prehistoric giants taken from mounds. Washington County grades Yield remains of race of 10,000 years ago. 49 skeletons found. Archaeologists amazed at excellent condition of teeth. Um, and here we have a uh, picture of uh, the mound. And some of you may have actually uh, uh, seen this similar uh, picture uh, posed as a hoax uh, with a giant skeleton uh, photoshopped into that. Um, and this, in theory, is, uh, at least according to the hoaxers, is a skeleton of, uh, um, I've seen it ranged everywhere from uh, about 20 feet to, you know, 40 feet tall. Um, but if you look at this old photograph, um, this copy is not a very good one, but, um, and you compare it to some of those uh, giant hoax videos and photos, uh, that's all it is. It's an old uh, Photoshop skeleton uh, that this 
uh, true photo lends some credence to. Uh, but this, the giants here, are actually more like eight feet tall. Um, but this uh, comes from El Rama, uh, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, Pennsylvania. The, uh, just outside of that, um, if you look at this picture that I'm overlaying here, um, it would be west or to the left of uh, this uh, El Rama uh, town that's on the Monon Monongahela River. Um, this gives you a, a better idea of where it was. Uh, if you look uh, outside where the circle is, outside of El Rama, that's more somewhere in that general vicinity. I couldn't pinpoint the exact, but um, over to the left you'll see uh, Finleyville, um, which is uh, a larger town, and uh, I'm going to overlay a different uh, map here in just a few moments that uh, will actually lend some real interest to the story as I develop it. Uh, but let's get into the article. It's written by W.T. Botsford. The unearthing of 49 bodies, 10,000 years old, today focused the interest of scientists the world over upon a wooded hillside near Pittsburgh. From this rustic region the, in Washington County, which has been the site of three civilizations, each thousands of years apart, the bodies, browned and baked before their burial by mound builders, have just been taken. They constitute one of the richest archaeological discoveries ever recorded in Pennsylvania and tell a crude history of an ancient American civilization. One skeleton is of a giant nearly eight feet tall. Another is a woman between whose teeth a gag of metal had been replaced. Perhaps a symbol that 10,000 years ago she had been irritating gossip of her tribe. The discovery was made on a headland high above the Monongahela River by G.S. Fisher, state archaeologist and member of the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, and his research aides, who had been digging in the Great Circular Knoll since Wednesday. The scene is on a wooded hill near the Perry Farm, one mile and a half from El Rama, a river town situated between Elizabeth and Monongahela City. The bodies, all brown and encrusted, and some mashed by the pressure of sandstone and soil, removed piece by piece and immediately placed in cloths and cardboard cartons for shipment to Fisher's headquarters in Fed Finleyville, eight miles away. There, the bones will be reassembled and delivered to the State Museum at Harrisburg. From the Capitol, some will be sent to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington for national study. Discovery of these odd folk, distinct from Indian inhabitants, gives us absolute proof that we had mound builders in Pennsylvania 10,000 years ago, just as in Ohio, West Virginia, Missouri, and the Southwest, Fisher said. Back from the promontory, 29 feet from the burial site, measuring 44 feet in diameter and 5 feet in height, the party found another terrace which they called an artifact, a place of sacrifice to the supreme deity, less pretentious than the main mound. From this circular knob, 24 feet across and 2 feet high, the investigators exhumed arrow points, flint knives, bear tusks, and two copper beads, the only metal found in the entire excavation. An effort was made to keep the excavation secret until the party was well on its, with its work. The news spread, however, and the moundsmen have already been observed probably by more people than they ever dreamed of. The bodies, it was evident, were buried on different levels in the circle horizontally faces forward. The bones shelved between eleven separate layers of stone. Were one to picture the place as a huge earthen donut, one would have noticed boulders, bodies side by side and head to toe around the periphery of the huge gouged ring. No bodies were uncovered within a seven foot radius of the center. The adults apparently were consigned to the outer edge of the disk. Fragile remains of children and women being found near the inner fringe of the space. While his assistants, bewhiskered and bronzed, stood guard over the graves, Fisher, attired in a dusty cocky coverall cut short above the elbow, described the finds using a bent limb for a pointer. He walked slowly and calmly about the clay mound, explaining the rebirth of a hardy race. Considerable attention was focused on the remains of a woman found on the fifth stone level to the south of the circle. The side nearest the river, with a petrified copper bead near her torso. 
Her skull was turned slightly to the side, and between her huge teeth, still firmly set in a projecting jaw, was a piece of flint. She might have been the n most noisome group of El Rama at one time. Who knows? Perhaps they put the flint in her mouth as a gag and a symbol of her garrulity, Fisher said. The giant skeleton measured 89 inches from the top of the skull to the flanges of the feet. It was covered with small stones, lay on the back, and measured 26 inches across the chest. All the skeletons seemed to have massive jaws, with little chins and strong teeth, which, when polished, showed a gloss in the sunlight, indicating the almost total absence of tartar. This proved, Fisher stated, that they apparently had massive chewing muscles, and that these ancient people were meat eaters. Never in all my discoveries of Indians, remarked Fisher. He has exhumed 445 bodies in his career. Have I seen strong, well-preserved teeth such as these? To the east and west of the circle, Fisher's body, party discovered beneath the tree and fallen trees two clay ovens. These, it is believed, were used to bake the bodies before they were buried. How did the party come to find the mound? Fisher, for years, had been seeking some trace of a civilization on what he terms El Rama Lower Site. In April, his tireless hunt was rewarded when one of his men, Frank Grillo of El Rama, discovered a crude image of ossified or bone-like clay. He found this 20-pound oddity on the Monongilla shore near Shire Oaks Railroad Yards. This crude piece, according to Fisher, is an effigy of the evil spirit and symbolizes by a turtle design, a wing, and a ridged carving, the earth, air, and water. Its presence indicated a sacred burial ground now discovered in the vicinity. Fisher maintains that in view of his discovery of Indian bodies in a hole a few years ago not far from the point of this discovery, that they compare, comprise the civilization of the second level of El Rama, built atop the ruins of a bound of builder's community and followed by continuous deposits of silt and debris. Twelve feet above the Indian town is the present site of El Rama, Fisher believes. In brief, the missing key to this place of three civilizations was found with unearthing of the piece of hard clay. That's the end of that article. Um, so we have two articles here. I'm going to uh, uh, insert here, and I'll show you something very interesting um, that I discovered while I was looking uh, at these articles and trying to piece together some of the folklore of the past. Here we have uh, a map of uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio together. You can see where Columbus is there and Pittsburgh on the other end of it. And I've circled the areas where uh, on the left is the first article from uh, near the Grove City area uh, to the east, uh, re west rather, of Columbus. Uh, the first article from 1899 discover discussing uh, the find of an eight foot tall skeleton uh, that matches uh, either a gorilla or a Bigfoot type description. On the right hand side of the map, you'll see another circle with that little red balloon uh, just south of Bethel Park there. Um, the El Rama find, uh, where several skeletons were found. Um, Again, uh, describing uh, what could be a potential uh, Bigfoot skeleton. And roughly halfway in between, uh, just to the right of Cambridge, Ohio, we found Salt Fork State Park, located in Ohio, of course. And those of us that have been uh, uh, into uh, this uh, Bigfoot phenomenon for a long enough time uh, realize that uh, Salt Fork State Park is one of the uh, uh, most well-known Bigfoot hot spots on the East Coast. Now, I find that interesting. Um, how about you? Okay, now we're going to go back, or rather go ahead in time, uh, a couple of years to uh, March 12th of uh, 1934, and we're going to look at a little article from the Berkeley Daily Gazette. It's bylined out of Washington, um, uh, and it's a United Press article, um, but uh, let's go through it real quick, and then I'm, we're going to talk a little bit about skeletons, and then after that I'm going to go into the uh, Von Kohn-Edgewald's uh, discovery of the uh, gigant 
Gigantopithecus uh, skull, uh, molars and uh, jawbone. And uh, an interesting uh, twist on that story uh, that we'll discuss after that. But here's that article. Um, again, this is coming from somebody uh, an interview of the uh, Smithsonian Institute. Uh, headline is Giants Are No More, declares Ridlicka. Um Again, it's a uh, uh, not a name that I see very often, so I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. If I'm not, I apologize for that. Um, but let's get into the article. The Smithsonian Institution is fed up on skeletons of prehistoric human giants, said Dr. Ailis Ridlicka. Curator of Anthropology makes no bones about it. Dr. Riduka claims the will to believe of amateur anthropologists for many reports of discoveries which find their way to his office with monotonous frequency. The fact that the bones aren't even interesting adds to his consternation. Occasionally, the scientist conceded a bone of abnormal human being is found, or bones of an animal which are descriptive or deceptive, rather, even to medical men, but this is a rarity. According to the institution, the purported finds describe an ancient race of giants between 7 and 8 feet tall, with bones and jaws considerably larger than those of men living today. The finder makes a hurried comparison of the length of the fossil thigh bone with his own, and from this calculates the size of the hypothetical ancient giant. However, it was explained, the person unfamiliar with human mm, anatomy does not know that the upper joint of the femur is several inches higher than would appear from superficial examination of a living body. Hence, the discovery and consequent disillusion. Next to human giants, Dr. Ridlka reports, fancy finds its way with human dwarfs. So, we see um, this article from... Uh, 1932 is pretty much one of the last uh, giant human being articles that I've found. Um, there are on occasion some after that point of time. Um, most of them, however, appear to be more of a hoaxed type story, uh, something like you might find um, popular on YouTube or Facebook or um, uh, in the weekly world news uh rags, that sort of thing, tabloids, uh, with no real proof to back them up. Uh, so this leads me to believe or suggest at this point in time that in 1934 uh, the Smithsonian Institution made a concerted effort to dismiss the possibility of there being human-like uh, beings that existed in past time or present time um, that may have resembled what we call uh, a Bigfoot or Sasquatch today. Again, most of these uh, descriptions that I found, and there are actually a good many articles out there that talk about this, um, and they uh, uh, tend to concentrate uh, on, number one, the height, and the height is usually 7 to 8 feet tall, uh, normally approximately 8 feet tall, uh, with large teeth, uh, large jaw bones, um, but apparently no skin, uh, rather chin, rather, sorry about that slip, um, which is kind of what we have for uh, descriptions involving the uh, Bigfoot today. Okay, so once again, we have these articles that have graced our newspapers on up to about the 1930-1932-33 time period. Uh, this is this one from 1932 is the biggest article that I found. Two years later, uh, we have an article where an official at the Smithsonian Institution officially dismisses the claims that there ever were uh, giant human beings or human-like beings that ever existed. Again, that's from uh, March 12th of 1934, if you want to go look that up, from the uh, Berkeley Daily Gazette. Okay, now we're going to jump forward a few more years, and we're going to talk about um, the von Konigswald and his discovery of the Gigantopithecus black eye. Um, and this is from June 30th of uh, 1944 from the uh, Toledo Blade newspaper. 
uh, which is still in existence today. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, raising any stinks here by uh, going over this article. Um, but uh, the headline reads, Huge Teeth, Jaw Bones Show Human Giants in Ancient China and Java. And it's bylined out of New York uh, by the Science Service. And before I get into this article, I want to let you know ahead of time that there are a uh, couple of racist statements made against the uh, Japanese and the Asians in this uh, um, article here. Uh, but you have to remember, this is from 1944, um, and it's dealing with the uh, Asian countries, uh, including the Japanese. Uh, so we're at the height of uh, uh, World War II, uh, you know, where... Uh, dealing with the uh, aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor from the previous uh, uh, December uh, attack. Um, and again, World War II was in full swing here. So uh, remember, uh, those aren't coming from me. These are coming from the time. And this is all part of uh, folklore. We have to take what was going on at that time and, and examine in detail uh, what life was like and this is all part of it but let's get into the article headlines huge teeth jaw bones show human giants in ancient China and Java giants who once lived in China would fit storybook descriptions of ogres for their fossilized teeth are six times as big as a modern man's and twice as big as a gorilla's far to the south in Java were other giants with jaw bones much bigger than those of any known human beings living or extinct. All that is known of these huge but vanished men is told in the new issue of Science by Dr. Franz Weidenreich of the American Museum of Natural History. His information has to be gleaned from a few fragments. A couple of jaw bones found in Java and three gigantic teeth dug out of a drawer in a Chinese apothecary shop in Hong Kong. Tantalizingly, further search for more complete Skeletal remains of these giants must await the expulsion of the Jap dwarfs from the islands they inhabited far back in the Ice Age days. Hints of the former existence of outsized men first began to turn up in Java from the same series of fossil bearing beds that more than half a century ago produced the then almost incredible bones of the famous Pith Pithecanthropus erectus. In 1937 and 1938, Two skulls of Pithecanthropus type were found there by Dr. R. von Konigswald of the Geological Survey of Netherlands Indies. In 1930, von Konigswald's native collector brought in a fossilized upper jaw from the same site. It is larger and more massive than any known fossil or recent human jaw, although it has an ape-like gap between the canine and incisor teeth. The teeth themselves and associated structure are distinctively human and not ape-like. The brain case, found some weeks later, is much bigger than the known Pithecanthropus skulls, principally because of the thickness of its bones and the size of its great eyebrow ridges and a crest that runs over its top. A matching fragment of a lower jaw bone was also found a few months later in the same year. Doctors Weidenreich and von Konigswald continue to regard these fossils as belonging to Pithecanthropus, despite their greater size. However, a lower jawbone found by Dr. von Konigswald in 1941 made this conservative classification impossible. It was simply too big to fit in, so Dr. von Konigswald gave it a new name, Meganthropus paleojavinicus, which means Big Man of Ancient Java. It may be that the large skull found in 1939 will prove upon re-examination to belong to this new species also. Discovery of evidence for the former existence of human giants in China was not made by digging in the field, but by digging in Chinese apothecaries, stocks and trade of fantastic materia medica. Dr. von Konigswald knew that these celestial medicine vendors deal in fossil bones and teeth, which they pound up for their poison potions. So whenever he could be rummaged, so whenever he could, he rummaged through their boxes and drawers. Between 1934 and 1939, he found in such apothecary shops in Hong Kong three molar teeth, evidently either simian or human, but six times as big as any human teeth ever seen. 
He took them at first for apes' teeth, and accordingly named the vanished species to which they had once belonged, Gigantopithecus blackei, or Black's giant ape. The specific name was given in honor of the late Dr. Davidson Black, original discoverer of the Peking Man. Dr. Weidenreich's re-examination of the teeth, however, has convinced him that they are human, despite their great size. So he suggests a renaming, Gigantanthropus, which means giant man. Dr. Weidenreich concludes his discussion with the suggestion that the original human beings may have been big, massive bone creatures. The occurrence of large fossil human skulls with very thick individual bones in early or late stages, for instance, in Homo solientis, Homo rodensiensis, and in the Heidelberg jaw, seem to indicate that gigantism and massiveness may have been a general or at least a widespread character of early mankind. The Japanese giants may have been, he estimates, of the size, stoutness, and strength of a big male gorilla. Dr. von Konigswald was still on the island of Java when the Japanese invaded, and his present whereabouts is unknown. Since he could not communicate with him to obtain his consent to announcing details of his discoveries, Dr. Weidenreich obtained official permission from the board for the Netherlands, Indies, Suriname, and Curacao. That's the end of that article. A um, couple of interesting things here is, number one, um, Konigs von Konigswald and his associates originally thought these were ape-like, from giant apes, uh, and hence they developed the name and attributed the name of Gigantopithecus black eye, or black eye, to um, this mysterious ape. Uh, but then, upon re-examination, it was discovered by one of his, or considered by one of his associates, rather, um, that these were actually human teeth, and they gave the name of Gigantanthropus. Uh, to this creature. Uh, the issue here that we get into is, number one, uh, we don't have the rest of the skeleton from this uh, so-called the Gigantopithecus, uh, so we can't tell for sure what it would have looked like, how big it would have been. Uh, the only descriptions we have are based upon supposition. Uh, there is no proof, there is no fact that shows that uh, Gigantopithecus black eye was a nine or ten foot tall gorilla like creature. Um, it's very difficult to tell for sure what some of these ancient skeletons were like based upon the limited bone structure that we have, so we have to compare what we have um, for a partial skeleton or partial remains with more complete remains of other creatures. Uh, long deceased to, um, well, to be polite, guesstimate what they would have looked like. So, uh, again, many of what we look at uh, for ancient beings, whether they be human or animal in nature, um, is based purely upon supposition. Uh, soft tissue, uh, flesh, uh, muscle, uh, sinew, cartilage, things like that, um, decay very quickly. Uh, and they never get fossilized, of course, because they're biological matter for the most part, uh, instead of mineral matter, such as bones. So uh, that's why we only find fossilized bones and never fossilized flesh. Uh, it is possible, and it has happened, that we have found flesh encased within uh, stones. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, dirt may have uh, covered something over and immediately, for whatever reason, turned into a hard casing, which would have kept uh, whatever was inside of it intact. But that's a discussion for another video, I guess. But uh, what we want to look at here is Bigfoot bones. Um, do they or do they not exist? And the question uh, and discussion that we need to address is, um, is it possible that the Smithsonian Institute purposely and deliberately uh, dismissed the possibility that uh, Bigfoot was in actual existence uh, prior to 1934 with their official decision that human giants never existed. Uh, but, again, I've gone on long enough here. I just want to leave it at that. 
uh, it appears as though while we look at Gigantopithecus black eye as being an actual species um, and turned into an ape thing, is it possible that it was not and that um, Weinreich's uh, discoveries and examination uh, was actually hidden or uh, buried by uh, scientists that wanted uh, to gain, uh, shall we say, importance with the Smithsonian Institute, uh, kind of made the stories disappear uh, so that they would not uh, be in direct opposition of what uh, the great and mighty Smithsonian Institute had decided would be a scientific fact uh, based upon their own opinion rather than uh, presentation of true facts. Uh, but, bottom line here, uh, Bigfoot bones, do they exist? Uh, my opinion, I think they do. And we get into the DNA subject here. Um, and again, we keep uh, looking at all these samples and we keep finding other things, but we keep finding human DNA in these samples. And I think the problem here is that we're looking at uh, the possibility of a Bigfoot being not a human being, but some sort of an ape. Um, and because of that, uh, I think a lot of the evidence that we have that would indicate the presence or existence of Bigfoot today uh, is actually found not in the different types of animal DNA, but in the fact that we keep finding human DNA. And we have to look at and address the question of is Bigfoot human or is Bigfoot something else. Um, but I'll leave you with that thought. And um, you can mull all of this uh, information over the Gigantopithecus angle of uh, Bigfoot's existence. Um, and uh, go from there. And uh, hope you enjoyed and hope you subscribe for more Bigfoot Tales on my channel. And uh, until next time, happy squatching.